טוב לכולם, אני יורה מצטערת שאני לא שם איתכם, אבל גם שמחה שאני איכשהו יכולה להשתתף בשיחה. זה נושא מאוד מאוד חשוב לי, ואני מקווה שאני גם יכולה לקבל ההיברים שלכם וגם המלצות על המחקר הזה, ששייך לספר שאני עכשיו עובדת עליו. תודה רבה. My project concerns the study group on the Book of Joshua hosted at the home of Prime Minister Ben Gurion from 1958 to 1959. The stated goal of the study group to generate a distinctly Israeli method of biblical interpretation is in evidence as much as its failure becomes apparent. In the end, the scholars and politician would-be scholars depend on rabbinic interpretation and modern biblical criticism mired, as they note, in Christian thought, the very positions they believe should be absent from their Israeli school of exegesis. They do succeed in bringing themes of conquest and settlement into the heart of Israeli culture and creating a founding war story meant to absorb the many factions and immigrant groups tenuously comprising the young state in 1958. As triumphalist and nationalist as the story of the 1948 war told in 1958 through the prism of biblical conquest is, however, it does preserve competing opinions and ultimately betrays the fact that the desired national formation exists only in the army and in the story of the war. In this, I argue, the interpretation most resembles its source text. Following scholarly consensus, I read the book of Joshua is composed of two distinct sections. Chapters 1 through 12, in my estimation, reflect the ideology of state centralization held by scribes promoting the monarchy in Jerusalem. In the name of consolidating a range of clans, tribes, and cities into a central government, these scribes created a story of a glorious conquest over all the land led by the exemplary general Joshua bin Nun. In the name of projecting the image of a unified people, these scribes repeatedly stress the word all, so that all Israel follows Joshua as they defeat all the kings of Canaan and conquer all the land. As much as it expresses their desire for totality, the repetition also reveals the degree to which the story of the war is the only place where all of this nation actually exists. In other words, the writers of Joshua tell a founding war story in order to unify disparate groups and to promote the idea of the nation through the image of the army. At the same time, these scribes and their patrons needed to make a nation out of something, namely the tribes and local groups who agreed to affiliate with the monarchy. So, as the scribes disseminate a story of a national founding war, they concede to these groups by incorporating their traditions in national history. This, I suggest, is the origin of the boundary list in the second half of Joshua, chapters 13 to 19, as well as many of the tales in Judges. Thus, beyond the relationship between a text and its interpretation, the book of Joshua and the commentary generated in Ben Gurion's study group appear as parallel instances of a war story that tries to make a nation exactly as it attests to the fact that the nation only really exists in a story that promotes war. The case of Ben Gurion's study group represents an attempt 
by a group of largely secular political and intellectual elites to promote a cohesive national culture premised on military discipline and unity among a population of Jewish immigrants. Like the editors of Joshua, Ben Gurion's group tells the story of a founding war as a means of absorbing constituents into a highly centralized state while denying the social realities that do not conform with the vision of that state. Ten years after Israel's founding war, Ben Gurion's group of interpreters turned to the book of Joshua as the basis for their own mobilizing war story. Just as contradictions run through the book of Joshua's conquest story, so dispute and differences of opinion broke out among the study group. However, the ultimate result was a nationalist narrative intended for public dissemination in which a mighty nation ends its long exile and achieves its destiny through a war against the peoples of the land and region. As closely parallel as this process runs to that of the book of Joshua, the interpretations of Ben Gurion and his group mark a dramatic turn in the history of Jewish biblical interpretation in which biblical events are taken as directly relevant to the contemporary scenario. Recognition of such relevance further operates to sanction and justify the actions of the state as legitimate and to a certain degree blessed. Scholars have commented on this Protestant turn in the Israeli reception of the Bible and understood it to be part and parcel of a concerted project of nationalist state building. Where centuries of diasporic interpreters had imagined Joshua, if they thought about him at all, as the disciple of Moses who promulgated Torah in the wake of his master's death, Ben Gurion and his group heralded Joshua as a general who conquered territory and settled tribes. As they retold the story of Joshua, the group asserted a state based on the book's twin pillars of conquest and settlement. The narrative that Ben Gurion and his study partners created reflects their struggle to make a nation out of a nascent society comprised of Jews from different countries and a range of socioeconomic backgrounds. As they sought to include and refashion these Jews as Israelis, Ben Gurion and his associates looked to distance Israelis from their neighboring Arabs. This interpretation, like its source text, represents a compensatory strategy intended to assert unity and cohesion in a shifting and varied social setting where the national formulation fails to manifest outside of military institutions. Hoping that a distinctly Israeli take on biblical history might reinforce the shaky basis of the state, Ben Gurion convened government officials, archaeologists, and biblical scholars to collectively interpret the book of Joshua. What I would like to do here is to show how Ben Gurion and his group used the book of Joshua in formulating their account of the 1948 war and how he specifically used his reading to redefine the notion of an indigenous people to promote national unity as essential to meeting military goals and to define the military as the most vital institution in the state of Israel. Although Ben Gurion could tolerate no fragmentation of the cohesive national identity that he promoted, his account, like the book of Joshua itself, conveys the sense of a social reality out of line with the story of a unified army and total victory.
As much as I think about the dynamic in the room of the Prime Minister's home where biblical scholars gather twice a month to debate the meanings of Joshua, I try to imagine how it felt for the participants to open the letter of invitation. That the letters would come from Chaim Bivariyahu, organizer of the study group, is almost certain. But how did Yohanan Aharoni feel upon realizing that he would face his opponent, Yigael Yadin, in front of one of Yadin's staunchest and certainly most powerful supporter? How did the historical geographer Ze'ev Vilnai take it that he could participate in the discussion but not give his own speech? How did the invitation strike Supreme Court Justice Shaul Zalman Cheshen. As, as much as these questions and the recorded conversations contribute to the overall project about the Joshua study group, let us here focus on the final words delivered by Ben Gurion entitled, The Antiquity of Israel in Its Land. Ben Gurion thought in binary terms. There was either a Jewish proletariat or a corrupted class of business owners, a nation state or a precarious diaspora, allies or enemies, and also believed in the essence of things. People, countries, books, all contained a latent essence that could be observed and extracted. As prime minister, he saw himself as responsible for discerning and releasing the unalloyed reality of the Jewish people, the homeland, and the Tanakh. But these essences could not simply rise to the surface at any occasion. They required certain conditions for discernment. In the case of Joshua, the founding war of 1948 provided the context in which its truth could at last be known. Quote, I realize how easy it will be to question my hypothesis, but I have reached it after the establishment of the state and the war of independence, which, at least for me, cast a new light on our distant past. Questions that I had never pondered as I read the Bible were aroused within me with an intensity that allowed me no rest." End quote. Ben Gurion presents statehood and war not merely as historical occurrences, but also as interpretive contexts that allow a distant past to be known. He believes that an essential aspect of Jewish peoplehood lay dormant until the momentous year of 1948. To his eyes, Nationalism and militarism are not novel characteristics befitting a post-colonial, post-Holocaust moment, but part and parcel of a realized Jewish essence. The War of Independence realized the archetype of Joshua's conquest and thereby liberated the Jewish people from existential threat and confining borders as well as from the distortions of a tradition that had depoliticized its founding text. The war was thus an act of interpretation and the soldiers those who unleash biblical truth. Although his interpretive authority derived from his position as prime minister and minister of defense, Ben Gurion attended to the text itself, combining fidelity and free imagination. His interpretations were novel, but guided by the actual words on the page. Essence could provide background and illuminate truth, but it could not negate the context of biblical verses. At the same time that the declaration of statehood and founding war clarified the meaning of Joshua, they also provoked questions about conquest and settlement. The kind of questions that allow Ben Gurion no rest show him to be more than a hack exegete pursuing political gain. 
In many ways, his interpretations illustrate the contradictions at the heart of biblical studies. His insistence on modern scientific methods gives him license, like so many biblical scholars, to reconstruct history in his image. But as a Jewish reader trained in a Polish chedda, Ben Gurion combines this scientific discourse with a midrashic method that discovers linguistic meaning through a literary framework that reads texts in light of other texts. He and his interlocutors named the combination of biblical studies methods and traditional Jewish exegesis the Israeli school of biblical interpretation and then employed it to read their own experiences and desires in the book of Joshua. The contradictions between the first and second halves of the book of Joshua are not lost on Ben Gurion, but form the basis of his unique historical chronology. Quote, the locations that are supposed to be settled listed in the second part of the book are largely not even mentioned in the conquest narratives of Joshua 2 through 12, end quote. How is it, he asks, that the sites of settlement and conquest do not coincide? As in his own times, Ben Gurion reasons that several different maps of a place can coexist because aspiration, reality, and the territorial conceptions of distinct groups all determine representations of place, multiple versions of homeland circulate simultaneously. The prime minister recognized value in the multiple representations of homeland captured in the book of Joshua. One place in particular stands out for its unique settlement history, the biblical city of Shrem. Shrem is Abraham's first stop on his tour of the land promised him by God. He marks his arrival in the land of the Canaanites by building an altar at the Terebinth of Moreh. After Jacob returns home following an extended journey, he purchases land in Shrem to settle his family and build an altar. The program of maintaining social difference while settling among Chibites hits a definitive limit when Dina, Jacob's daughter, is raped by the local prince. All the same, Moses urges the people of Israel to return to Shrem and build an altar in a ritual recapitulation of national revelation. Ever the faithful disciple, Joshua does as Moses instructed, emulating the revelation at Sinai by reading the Torah aloud to the people arrayed on Gerizim and Eval, the twin mountains of Shechem. The textual repetition of the word all suggests to Ben Gurion the national fulfillment at hand. Joshua gathers all Israel, reads all the words according to all that is written in the scroll of the Torah. Not one word of all that Moses commanded was left unread by Joshua before all the community of Israel. The totality of this gathering and symbolic import of Shrem aroused Ben-Gurion's interest in this early history of the Palestinian city of Nablus. He wonders specifically how Joshua can convene such an assembly in plain view without having conquered the city. Where are Joshua's Canaanite enemies during the mass gathering of Israel? Why doesn't the king of Shechem come out to oppose him? Ben Gurion never denies the limitations of Joshua's conquest. After all, Joshua constitutes his primary analogy to the 1948 war, which also left so much more to be conquered. So his novel interpretation on this count is not quite compensatory.
Rather than ignore the biblical record of Israelite cohabitation with other peoples, he realigns the ethnic categories of the Bible. He builds an innovative thesis of eternally indigenous Jews in the land of Israel, in which two distinct groups comprise the ancient people of Israel, an elite pioneering group who received the law at Sinai and marched across the Jordan with Joshua, and a more populous group of Hebrews indigenous to Canaan. The pioneers formed a compact social unit descended from the family of Joseph, whereas the Hebrews of Canaan were nearly indistinguishable from their neighbors. Joshua's pioneers were an elite corps who had been exposed to the advanced culture of the Egyptian empire and chosen by God to receive the law at Sinai. Yet their knowledge and skill amounted to little until they returned to the land of their fathers and devised a state. While these elites experienced fluctuating fortunes in Egypt and found their true nature in the wilderness, the bulk of their kin remained in Canaan and blended with their neighbors. Shrem, in Ben Gurion's eyes, was the long-standing cultural and spiritual center of Hebrew Canaan to which Joshua brought his people in the name of reunion with their native counterparts. There, the diasporic elite encountered their indigenous compatriots and incorporated them into the national army. Because of this project of reunification and a largely successful campaign against non-Hebrew natives, things got much better for both groups. Ultimately, David, king of Israel, established the far superior capital in Jerusalem. Lest one think that turning the native Hebrews of Canaan against their neighbors was a bad idea, Ben-Gurion stresses that the natives reap the greatest benefit. Mixing with neighbors, Ben-Gurion explains, represents a form of backsliding from monotheism as well as from the sublime possibilities of national spirit. By forgetting their God, the natives lost the spirit and achieved nothing. Joshua revives them, binds them to their people, and enables them to achieve the independence befitting their collective essence. By separating them from the other locals, the pioneers uplift the natives and restore them to the ranks of the chosen people. Ben Gurion arrives at this theory through probing questions that rehearse the reasons for the Zionist mo movement. Foremost, he asks why anyone would abandon countries of advanced culture for the backwater of Canaan. Abraham left Mesopotamia, quote, a rich and cultured land to go to that poor and backward land, end quote, and the people of Israel, although with little choice due to Pharaoh's vow to destroy them, similarly emigrated from an advanced society to its hinterland. Ben Gurion does not, as one might suppose, call upon oppression as the reason that Israel must have its own country. Instead, Israel deserves its land because, according to him, it has always been the land of the Hebrews. Hebrews were indigenous to the land, and the wanderers of the Bible had always come in search of them with a clearer, purer conception of identity that only privileged members of the diaspora could cultivate. Abraham journeys to find these Hebrews. Jacob reunites his family with them in Shem. They sustain Joshua's troops during the long march of conquest, and the earth itself still bears their traces. Ben Gurion flouts the model of rights through conquest presented in the book of Joshua in order to insist on rights 
based on priority. Quote, my first assumption is that the Jewish people, or even the Hebrew people, was born in Israel and grew up in Israel, even before the days of Abraham, as one of the nations of Canaan, and at that time was scattered in the south, the central sector, and the north, with its spiritual and possibly and possible political center in Shem. End quote. This marks a surprising intervention in the discourse of primacy. Hebrews, Jews even, belong to the land according, belong to the land through nativity. Rather than conquerors of Canaan, Ben Gurion's Hebrews are legitimate members of a Canaanite federation. Quote, Canaan signifies an umbrella term similar to Israel, with a double meaning in the Torah and in the book of Joshua. It is both the name of one of the peoples of Canaan's, like the Perizzites, Girgashites, Hivites, Jebusites, and is also the general name for all of the peoples of Canaan, including Hebrews. Insofar as Hebrews belong to the land, Joshua does not initiate a conquest so much as a civil war that redeems the indigenous Hebrews from the clutch of incorrect worship and backward culture. From a political standpoint, the problem with the native Hebrews rests in their decentralized system that Joshua corrects by establishing a centralized state. This state is not merely a set of bureaucratic institutions, but also the agent of cultural revival. As a prelude to establishing this state, Joshua brings his message to Shechem, the current capital and historic birthplace of the monotheistic Hebrews. At first, Ben Gurion's positions seem almost counterintuitive. Why bring up native claims when the legitimacy of the state of Israel depends upon the denial of Palestinian indigenous rights? Ben Gurion himself had approved and presided over the expulsion of Palestinian communities and subjected those incorporated by Israel to military rule. Why give voice to a mode of territorial claim so threatening to the Zionist enterprise when discussing a biblical book that justifies holy war? I suggest that Ben Gurion arrives at his interpretation because the notion of historical fulfillment figures so prominently in his thought. Ten years into statehood, Ben Gurion desired its justification through history rather than war. Of course, he was a politician singularly driven by the project of nation building, but he was also a thinker who wanted to settle the issue of Jewish belonging. On this count, he claimed to have discovered the essence of Jewish belonging in the book of Joshua. Jews belonged in Israel not simply because the young state prevailed in its war, but because they were properly natives of the land. Without stating it outright, Ben Gurion discounted Palestinian claims by dating Jewish ones to a considerably earlier era. Palestinians may have been present when the waves of Im Jewish immigration began, but they did not and could not possess the same historical spiritual link. Should Palestinians cite their own sense of Canaanite ancestry, then Ben Gurion could point to co-extant ancient Hebrews. His reading recapitulates acts of physical Palestinian removal during the war and post-war post settlement period by erasing non-Hebrew peoples from biblical concern, or at least dismissing their claims. <laughs>
But whereas non-Hebrew natives can only have a corrosive influence, Ben-Gurion views knowledge gained in the diaspora as the necessary component of nation building. Ben-Gurion's interpretation enabled him to solve the exegetical crux of the two speeches with which the book of Joshua ends. Interpreters have long faced the question of how to account for the repetition of farewell speeches with which Joshua's life and his book ends. Joshua parts from his people in both chapter 23 and 24, but reestablishes the covenant between Israel and God only in chapter 24. Why are there two separate speeches, but only one covenant ceremony? Where the historical linguistic approach, source criticism, answers the problem of repetition by attributing the speeches to scribes from different periods, Ben Gurion perceived two separate audiences addressed by a great leader on his deathbed. Quote, a thorough, chapter, a thorough study of chapter 24 must lead one to the conclusion that the gist of this chapter was neither written later nor added, but includes the main contents of the book of Joshua, and in any case is its earliest and most reliable portion." End quote. Not only does Ben Gurion refuse to marginalize Joshua's last speech as a later addition, but he also insists that it contains its most important kernel of historical truth. In chapter 23, Ben Gurion suggests, Joshua encourages the community that escaped Egypt, the new immigrants, Olim Chadashim, to uphold the Torah given to them by Moses. Quote, chapter 23, does not even mention the exodus from Egypt because those who came from Egypt did not need to hear the story." End quote. Joshua's immigrant pioneers may need encouragement as they settle a strange homeland, but they do not need a rehearsal of their own recent history. Quote, the covenant had long been in effect and was familiar to the listeners. Furthermore, their identity forged in the wilderness is cohesive and durable. Quote, they were no longer divided into tribes because those who went down to Egypt and those who left Egypt were united all the while by one faith, one hope, and were led by one teacher, end quote. The pioneers well understood the need for unity in a time of conquest and relied on religion and a sense of shared destiny to bind them. A strong central leader further supported the necessary cohesion. The group had a key role to play in the land insofar as their unity and sense of purpose awoke the indigenous Hebrews from their stupor and catalyzed a revival movement. In the absence of the new immigrants, nothing would have changed in Canaan, and the glorious past would have remained dormant. This parsing of Joshua expresses three core principles of ben Gurion's statism, immigration, acculturation, and centralization. He believed that a country built on successive waves of Jewish immigration required a definitive culture for the immigrants to adopt. The Judaism that formed the very basis for immigration and statehood was utterly deficient in his eyes by virtue of its 2,000 year Ashul of nationalism. In place of religious practice, immigrants needed to adopt an Israeli national identity. His insistence upon acculturation intersected with the principle of centralization insofar as Ben Gurion believed that he was personally responsible for forging the national culture. 
Hebrew language formed an important part of this culture, as did military service, but living an interpretation of the Bible was the sine qua non. Just as Joshua transformed the Hebrews by way of the texts brought from Sinai, so biblical narratives of a nation and war could remake the Jews of the diaspora into proper Israelis. The Tanakh was their patrimony, but scholastic interpretation had distanced them from its essence. Quote, the Tanakh was without a doubt one of the main causes of the formation of our national character, yet this cause came from within, from the midst of the nation. The greatness of the Tanakh is the greatness of Israel's spirit. It is a product of this spirit, a product of the spirit of the heroes of our nation." End quote. Really, reasoned Ben-Gurion, God had not given the Jews the Torah. They had produced it as a reflection of an exemplary national spirit. This position epitomizes Ben-Gurion's brand of secular messianism. God had neither liberated Egypt, God had neither liberated Israel from Egypt, nor revealed its holy scripture. Rather, Israel had aroused its latent will, freed itself, and poured its spirit into a national history. Because the Tanakh belongs to the Jews in perpetuity, it can move their collective transformation and acculturate them correctly in modern Israel. As it describes ancient war heroes, the Tanakh motivates modern day war heroes embodying a national spirit. The glorious nation Ben Gurion recognized in the pages of the Bible conformed to the country that he wanted to lead. The figure of the pioneer held together all of Ben Gurion's most deeply held values, including self sacrifice, working the land, and military defense. The very term chalutz derives from the book of Joshua, where it describes an infantry comprised of men from the two and a half tribes who live east of the Jordan River. In the Israeli culture that Ben Gurion helped develop, the Zionist vanguard of the Second Aliyah formed the elite. They had founded the kibbutzim, formed the militias, and were now running the government. Just like the group that marched with, Josh that marched with Joshua, Ben Gurion viewed his Ashkenazi cohort as the catalyst of statehood, an elite in an ideological rather than material sense. This elite core ushered in a steady process of development, and without them, Israel's glorious past would never have been restored. In the allegory, then, who figures as the native Hebrews of the land? To the Prime Minister's eyes, in chapter 24, which describes the covenant ceremony at Shrem, Joshua, quote, starts his remarks with a lecture on the ancient history of the nation, as Ben Gurion himself was prone to do. The biblical leader then chastises the Hebrew tribes who had degenerated into Canaanite idol worship and recounts the history of the elite in order to provide them with a model of correct behavior. For those who never left the land and never knew Moses, the veterans or long-standing residents, Vatikim, this serves as their Sinai. The revelation shakes them however temporarily, from their idolatrous oblivion. More importantly, it creates motivated leadership among the elders of the old settlement. And the recruitment of these elders facilitates the mass transformation from tribalism to nationalism. Ben Gurion detects the inferiority of the native Jews at multiple levels. They live a tribal life, 
They harbor foreign gods, and they are not the least bit aware of God's covenant. His combination of nativity and tribalism suggests that Ben Gurion speaks about the Arab world. He likely has Middle Eastern, Mizrahi Jews in mind. As much as he sought to strip immigrants from Muslim countries of their religiosity and to foster nationalism in its place, Ben Gurion entertained most of the romantic conceptions of Orientalism. He considered Jews from Middle Eastern countries to be indigenous, pure of heart, hardworking, simple folk, able to withstand deprivation better than their Ashkenazi counterparts. A simple and unsparing man himself, Ben Gurion showed greater empathy towards immigrants from Middle Eastern countries. As Anita Shapira writes, they were, for Ben Gurion, a symbol of the state's success in creating the new man. End quote. Although the state needed to be run by the Ashkenazi pioneering elite, Jews from the Middle East for Ben Gurion reflected the better part of Jewish history and transformation of the people. At the same time, the discovery of native Hebrews in the pages of Joshua recalls Ben Gurion's pre-state idea that the Palestinians were actually Jews who had remained in the land following the Roman exile and eventually converted to Islam. Zionist immigration, according to this model, might well have awakened the memories of the native inhabitants of Palestine and rejoined these lost tribes to their people. This was no longer a practical program for Ben Gurion in 1958, yet Ben Gurion's idea that many of the Arabs inhabiting present-day Israel stemmed from these tribes meant that, quote, the events of the time of Moses and Joshua can occur again today. The Arabs who are flesh of our flesh can adapt once again, assimilate, and return to our midst, end quote. If Palestinians for Ben Gurion were actually descendants of the tribes of Israel, then the land of Israel could rightfully belong to them by means of ancient grit, victorious conquest, and continuous habitation. Ultimately, Ben Gurion surrendered his vision of Palestinians joining the Jewish national cause, yet maintained that Jews were and had always been properly indigenous to the land. The vision of indigenous Jews helped Ben Gurion to reconcile different stages of his thinking about Arab communities in Palestine. In the 1920s and 1930s, he advocated a federation encompassing Iraq, Transjordan, and Palestine. The Federation would be Arab with provisions for a Jewish state or autonomous Jewish regions should immigration be permitted throughout the Federation. No Arab who wanted to remain in a Jewish region would be dispossessed and if Iraq were part of the Federation, he tried to convince British authorities, then no Jew would be dispossessed from an Arab region. In practical terms, the Federation idea came to an end with the Palestinian general strike of 1936-39. At this point, Ben Gurion accommodated British partition schemes while resisting the attendant limitations on Jewish immigration. Still, he insisted that the Arab inhabitants would not be driven off their lands or out of the state. Jews would only settle in open spaces, redeeming uncultivated land. Later, his later assessments stressed the lack of a sense of nationality and feeling for homeland and soil among Palestinians. And when the opportunity to conquer more territory arose, 
in the 1948 war, Ben-Gurion presided over Joshua-like evacuations and destructions of Palestinian towns. In the conquered areas that remained standing and populated, he established a repressive military rule restricting freedom of movement, organization, and expression that formally endured until 1966. His idea of collective, continuous Jewish presence in the homeland seems to have aimed toward the legitimization of the expulsion of non-Jews and uneven distribution of privilege and ethno-economic exclusions of the young state. Parallel to the Book of Joshua, Ben Gurion's emphasis on an inaugural war that fulfills destiny functioned as a centralizing narrative intended to obscure a very different social reality. Conjuring up indigenous Hebrews from the pages of the Bible in the 1950s was more pointedly a technique of circumventing Palestinian claims. In spite of his identification of two distinct Hebrew groups, Ben Gurion was obsessed with, with proving the cohesiveness of the ancient nation. In his mind, the people of Israel had no competing or coextensive identities. There was no tribal way of life, argued the prime minister. The tribes were simply interchangeable administrative divisions. Rather than a tribal order similar to the structure of Arab societies, Ben Gurion asserted that ancient Israel's divisions were more like those of the Israeli military. Quote, what the Tanakh tells us about the tribes pertains to the divisions like those we established, we established in the Israeli Defense Forces the Golani Brigade, the Alexandroni. According to the Tanakh, there were no tribes at first. Each tribe did not develop with its own leaders and its customs and then unify as a single nation. There was no schism or difference among the tribes. Everyone conquered the land together under one leader. Suddenly, this leader died and the tribes arose. Ben Gurion's mode of interpretation operates at different levels. First, he frames the history of the modern state in terms of the biblical narrative of exodus and conquest and settlement as events of the present. Then he uses this mythic Israeli present to interpret scripture. In this way, the tribes of ancient Israel become units of the Israeli army, and the example of the army proves the unity of ancient Israel. As much as the Bible legitimizes and justifies modern Israel for Ben Gurion, the context of modern Israel allows the Bible to be read correctly. The correct reading points to total cohesion of constituent groups through the duration of the war. The strong leadership of Joshua affects this unity and enables the nation to emerge. Quote, occupation, settlement, tribe, nation. I doubt if a scattered and divided people that has no land and no independence could know the true meaning of these words and their full content. Those who do not engage in conquest cannot know what is involved in the act of conquest. It is the same thing with settlement. Only with the establishment of Israel in our generation did these abstract concepts assume skin, sinews, and flesh so that we know their content an essence, end quote. According to Ben Gurion, Jews could not correctly interpret Joshua before the rise of the state of Israel. Unable to reenact its concepts, these readers missed their meaning 
Israeli war and settlement embodied Joshua and exhibited the national dimension of Torah neglected over so many centuries of exile. As the materialization of occupation and settlement proved the veracity of Joshua, it also placed stress on contemporary bodies and locations to signify biblical truths. Even in his certainty about the unity of Israel, Ben Gurion's abiding anxiety can be sensed regarding the dissipation of the collective that might occur after the death of a national founder. Quote, even though the people was divided into 12 tribes in the days of Moses and Joshua, it was united and worked and fought as one national unit and heeded one leader, first Moses and afterwards Joshua. Only after the death of Joshua do we find the nation split and divided into tribes, with every tribe fighting separately or in a group, as in the days of the prophetess Deborah." End quote. Against the grain of biblical studies, Ben Gurion imagines tribalism as a devolution following a golden age of national harmony. Further anxiety about ideological as well as ethnic differences among the newly forged Israelis pervades Ben Gurion's interpretation. Such differences seem to him the very forces that could undermine the centralized state. Deliverance, in his view, could only be achieved through mamlachtiyut, centralized state institutions, policy, and culture, since the state figured as, quote, the only political and symbolic entity that could bind together the fragmented Jewish people, end quote. On the basis of the two inferred audiences of Joshua's speech, Ben Gurion made a series of trans historical claims. Canaan had always been a land inhabited by Hebrews. Not only did Joshua find compatriots there who were ready to take up arms, but Abraham also traveled to Canaan because of the presence of like minded residents. For Ben Gurion, this meant that the link between modern Jews and the land transcends the spiritual and historical dimension. Jews are indigenous to this land, and their separation from it caused centuries of trauma. Ben Gurion subjected the concept indigenous to a very particular definition. On the one hand, the fact that most tribes never left establishes the indelible link between the people of Israel, which Ben Gurion easily glossed as Jews and the land. And on the other hand, the local tribes were closer in spirit to their Canaanite neighbors, a backward group that required redemption through, quote, the return of the elite among the Hebrew people to the land. Transcendent biblical national spirit aside, immigration to the state of Israel did not miraculously foster cohesion. And furthermore, the social conditions of the 1950s made it particularly difficult to forge such a culture. Palestinian communities remained within the borders of the state created by the 1949 Armistice Agreement and made concerted appeals for the restoration of their expropriated property and rights. The paradigm of Israelites and Canaanites, along with the ethno-national premise of Ben-Gurion's state, left little room for Palestinian recognition or enfranchisement and influence may have influenced the decision to subject Palestinian citizens of Israel to martial law. Palestinians who had fled or been expelled by the army during the war lived in an unstable state of asylum just beyond the borders of Israel 
often crossed over to reclaim property, harvest their lands, or engage in acts of revenge. This perceived threat to the integrity of the state was named infiltration and addressed through military reprisals that eventually crystallized into state policy. Thank you. No? Oh, no. Along, along with the problem of Palestinians who did not fit with the ethno-national conception of the state came the problem of assimilating waves of immigrants who came from different parts of the world, spoke different languages, and practiced forms of Judaism not necessarily in line with a hegemonic national secularism. In 1958, Two out of every three Israelis were immigrants, many without working knowledge of Hebrew, who did not have first-hand experience of the 1948 war. Faced with the Palestinians present in the state or just beyond its frontiers, who figured as non-nationals, as well as the material and cultural differences of Jewish immigrant communities, Ben Gurion turned to the interpretation of the Book of Joshua, now as a means of stipulating the characteristics of a cohesive, centralized nation with a unified citizenry and obedient military. Achshav, toda rabat.